Hello and welcome to Dharamsala. My name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president of the United States Institute of Peace, which is a national nonpartisan institute dedicated to prevention and resolution of violent conflict around the world. We work with partners uh, to apply very practical applications of how to do this. And we work especially with young leaders around the world who are key to a more peaceful future. We're here in Dharamsala, uh, having just concluded our second annual Youth Leader Dialogue with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, which is a wonderful partnership that we've had for two years now that creates a dialogue this year between 25 youth leaders from 12 different countries affected by violent conflict, as well as a small group of experts who accompanied us. And it's an opportunity for the youth leaders to share their stories with His Holiness and to have an exchange about what does it take to be a peace builder? How do you maintain the inner resilience to stay on this difficult work? And how do you turn difficult experiences into a commitment and a conviction that peace is possible? It was truly a remarkable couple of days, I think life-changing for many of us, and I know that many of the youth leaders are taking home with them uh, renewed conviction that their work is truly making a difference in very, very difficult places, and that His Holiness was equally inspired by hearing from them and learning from them. So thank you for joining us for what is a dialogue uh, to reflect on some of what we discussed over the last several days. And it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague at the U.S. Institute of Peace, Carla Coppell, who is the Vice President for Applied Conflict Transformation at USIP. She will moderate the panel, beginning by introducing our other speakers. So thank you for joining us and enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Nancy, and uh, thank you really to everyone who's in the room, including our tremendous panel for an inspiring couple of days. It's been a wonderful set of conversations, uh, really, really important dialogue, uh, and we look forward to having a conversation again in this room that captures some of the spirit and the experience of that, uh, that discussion and also builds on it with some additional uh, substantive conversations. On my far left, I'm honored to be on the stage with um, Gare Dwani, who since 2015 has been a goodwill ambassador with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, as well, to be here with Mahmoud Khalil, who's a Syrian refugee living in Lebanon. He's an activist and advocate for refugee education. Thank you. I've enjoyed getting to know you. Thank you. Fatima Askiri, who has founded the Askira, who founded the Boro Women's Development Organization, which is actively promoting in northern Nigeria uh, efforts to prevent radicalization and counter the impact of Boko Haram in partnership with many women in that region. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, uh, we have Dr. Jeremy Richman, who's a neuroscientist and who founded the Aviel Foundation after his daughter was killed in the Sandy Hill shooting, school shooting in 2012. Jeremy, thank you for joining us. We're going to start the conversation with a little bit of an introduction of the four people on the panel. Then we'll have a bit of a conversation with them. Then we really want to make sure that you hear from the full delegation because it is a tremendous group of young leaders who are making a difference for tens of thousands of people all around the world in active conflict zones. And they are incredible. So I want you to have a chance to meet all of them. But let's start up here. Gare, you have quite a personal story, uh, but let's start with really what inspired you to become a Goodwill Ambassador, um, because I know that is both a personal and professional choice for you of great importance. Well, first, thank you for introducing me and giving me the opportunity to, to share my personal story and also the work that I'm really doing. I, I decided to join the UNHCR when uh, the Civil War broke out in my home country because I live in base in New York, and I wasn't sure how I could really help. You know, being an activist, I felt like I was a one person, but working with a big organization like the UNHCR, it was pretty much what could really help the refugees that were streaming out of South Sudan. So that's the reason I joined them and partnered up and become a Goodwill Ambassador 
to the regions and also uh, I engage with other people all around the world to advocate for refugees globally. So I knew that when the war broke out, and it's going to be a, it's going to be a, the outcome is going to be terrible because I was in the previous civil war in the 80s and the 90s. So when this kind of war, they really happen, have an experience. So there's no another way that I can really help besides really just joining an organization. I didn't have to join any other part because this is a war within one country, South Sudan, the new nation. Very well, thank you for sharing that. And I know we'll hear more of your personal story in the conversation. Jeremy Richmond, you have come to this conversation <clears throat> with uh, both an incredible education that is uh, provides you with incredible insight into the effects of conflict and trauma and how you pivot to really have resilience and become a leader, um, as well as a personal experience that many would imagine would leave you, and we were talking about it yesterday evening, curled up in bed and really just mourning the loss of your daughter. How have you channeled that to be such an incredible leader, and what do you think that's indicative of for how you move, move forward uh, following conflict and trauma? Um, well, you know, I can, I can only speak from my personal experience, but from what I hear from uh, so many of the young leaders here and in, in our experiences uh, with, with other people responding to tragedies, um, when, when you're faced with, with such heartbreak and uh, this you know, unfathomable like, uh, depth of loss, you need some purpose, something to get you out of bed, exactly. And, um, when we lost our daughter in the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, um, my wife and I immediately said we needed to play to our strengths because we were scientists. And we said we need to approach uh, this problem of violence that we have from a scientific viewpoint. And so we, uh, we created uh, the Aviel Foundation committed to preventing violence and building compassion through neuroscience research to understand what happens in the brain what are the risk factors that lead to violence? And what are the protective factors that can lead away from that and towards compassion, connection, resilience? Um, and that wasn't enough. We, need, we recognize that science in a vacuum is really of no value unless you can give it to the everyday world citizen in a way that's approachable, digestible, makes sense, and could be applied uh, in a time of crisis in a meaningful way. So the other half of our foundation is community engagement and education. Great, thank you for that introduction and that framing. Fatima, you're a brave woman. You live in a neighborhood with Boko Haram, which specifically has targeted women and girls, and yet you've decided to take on the challenge of women and girls empowerment directly uh, in that part of the world. Could you talk a little bit about that choice and how you came to it and what you're working on? Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, but uh, I think to me, my work is not just a choice, but also a responsibility because uh, I saw what trauma looks like in many women and young girls who could easily be me, as I usually say and tell people, but then I also feel this is my community and the only thing I have to give back to the community is my head and my soul to serve the people and particularly women who have always been at the bottom. I mean, in where I grew up, women are always kind of sec uh, secondary and it's usually dominated by men. So I find it particularly interesting to support women considering the fact that Boko Haram had affected many but then 90% of those affected and left behind are women and children. So if I don't give in to empower those women and support them psychosocially, mentally, and economically, then the future of the children they're leaving behind is going to be terrible. I mean, more terror would be faced in future than what we're currently facing because based on research and other things, we found out that we have more than 50,000 orphans already and women are many without empowerment, without education. So one way I can contribute to the community and get myself involved is by establishing an organization which will primarily focus on women and the children. And I feel this is a responsibility, not just a choice on me. Thank you so much. Mahmoud, there are many issues you could have chosen to focus on and you focus on refugee education. Why is that? 
Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, because I'm a refugee myself, I, I decided to focus on education because I lost two, two years of my life just looking for an opportunity, uh, a university scholarship, anything that I can continue my life. I was traumatized for over a year looking for any opportunity that I can continue my life. After getting opportunity working with an organization called Jusur, which supports the education of, Syria, of the Syrian uh, refugees uh, uh, in, in the neighbor, neighboring country, but in particular in Lebanon, uh, I, I found myself in a position that I can decide what a program we can, uh, I can implement. So I decided to focus on the marginalized uh, Syrian, uh, Syrian uh, students, university age students who are lost. So those students, uh, because if they lost hub, they would go, if they lose hub, they would go to be extremists. And you know, like in a situation like Syria, now like Syria faced a lot of, uh, faces a lot of challenges. So we don't want these people to go to be extremists. Also another reason, so these people can help, who, who got scholarship, can help in rebuilding Syria. Now Syria lost a lot of resources, so we need people in the future to rebuild it. Great, thank you very much. All of you in your comments talked about the road away from trauma and how you recover. Um, could you speak to us a little bit about the science of recovery and how you move through that process and where we are with understanding the path forward uh, from challenging situations? Well, it, it's, a, it's not as satisfying an answer as I wish I could give. The, um, we talked a little bit uh, today and yesterday with His High Holiness the Dalai Lama about the, the idea that um, it's far better to uh, work on prevention uh, than repair. That being said, we do know that the brain is profoundly affected by tra traumatic experiences. That, and the, these effects can be long lasting if, uh, if, it isn't, uh, if it isn't helped, if there's no interventions. Effective interventions um, are going to vary profoundly based on the individual and you know, the culture in which the, they reside. But they certainly involve uh, you know, getting outside help uh, in different forms. Uh, that could be different therapies uh, in many different settings that are effective, um, but it also requires uh, internal help, you know, self-help, um, looking for forms of uh, um, physical healing, uh, introspection, understanding this, the source of the, of, the, of the trauma, recognizing that it's there and, and, uh, and its nature, and that can be very difficult uh, to, to face. Um, but the hope, for everyone, is that uh, while these knots can be tied, uh, they can be untied. And the brain is another organ, like the heart, the lung, the liver, and the kidneys. It can be healthy and it can be unhealthy. Uh, and like those, it can, um, it can be treated to become healthy again when it's diseased. Um, we call this neuroplasticity. The brain is uh, able to change in response to its experiences throughout our lives. And so uh, there's, there is hope, but uh, um, I think uh, for most of us in here um, who clearly have a high degree of resilience, um, they, they still are going to face you know, some ghosts, some trauma in there that they're going to need other people to rely on to help them out and, uh, and focus on, on helping themselves. Thank you. Gare, I wonder in listening to Jeremy, what occurs to you in terms of your personal journey? Uh, he's a scientist. I mean, anything that he say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I had to comply to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. You know, um, post-traumatic stress disorder is, is, a, is a serious uh, issue, even something that always concerned me. Because I remember when I first went to the United States, uh, I, I kind of experienced that, too, a lot more. And then uh, if I didn't really play basketball or physical, activities like intense basketball, I don't think I would really uh, make it in America because uh, it kind of affected me. But I didn't know until I really went to university and then I was studying psychology. And one of my professors told me, uh, what, what kind of life did you have in the past? And one day I was just sharing with him and then he asked me what kind of experience that I'd be 
having or dreams, and I explained it to him, and he's like, yeah, man, this is, this, these are the signs of post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, you should, you should start to share with people. But not only that, you know, uh, because uh, the civil war in Sudan, uh, previous civil war, and then uh, there's many cases in our community that people are really dealing with it in the United States, you know. And then uh, that's the reason, you know, I took interest in majoring in human services and, mm -hmm. and psychology, child psychology. It's because of that. So if an expert like Jeremy can really tell us about it, it is, it's real. And those cases really happen even in developing country, in, uh, in the developed countries. And, um, so yeah, it's true. How long did it take you to feel like you would move to a next stage personally? Oh, the thing is, uh, yes, it's, it's a good question because I've been in America for 24 years, you know, and then it's not like it's completely, it will leave you. I don't think so, you know, I, I, and uh, it doesn't leave anybody, but you can really notice it and try to track a few things here and there down so that you're aware about it. So I'm pretty aware about it, but it's not fully uh, gone. But it used to be more. But nowadays I don't even dream anymore, so that's another thing. So I think I'm rested in the mind. I'm glad. <laughs> Mahmoud, Fatima, you deal with large populations of people who are coping with difficult situations. Stories or observations from the people that you're working with? Actually, just to echo uh, what uh, Gere said, uh, in our schools, like we have so many students who are just came from Syria, came from war, a war to be settled inside a, a settlements like tent. There's no construction on them. So at first, like we we uh, noticed that the uh, the students the. The, the students inside the, the classrooms, they are not doing that good. So here we, we, we thought that our curriculum is not good enough for them. We thought that our teachers are not trained well to teach these students. After uh, a psychosocial uh, expert came to the school and did an ex experiment over like, f more than three months over all our uh, uh, children. So we found out that most of our students are traumatized, but we can't see that. They don't show it but they are traumatized. Because they live in a situation in, their, in the tent where they can't, they can't uh, play, uh, they, they left their, most of them left their, families, their family in Syria. Some of them f uh, saw bodies, like dead bodies in Syria. So the, the, these children are the most affected, uh, uh, the most affected uh, people of, of, uh, in Syria. So that's why, uh, getting healing from tra trauma is really important. So now we have a psychosocial support, uh, a counselor at each of our school, hmm. just to overcome this, uh, the, uh, this uh, obstacle. And have you seen a difference? Uh, so, like, to see a difference needs time, mm -hmm. like not in, not in six months or a year. So far we found in some cases, because in these cases you have to work individual with, with each uh, student, not all of them. Also, we have to work with their families because their families are also traumatized. So, so far we, we have seen uh, improvement, but not, not, not that much. Mm. That's interesting. Fatima. Yeah, so I, I mean, for me, depending on you know, the context where I come from, I can say not just the people I work with directly, but even the people I see indirectly are also traumatized. Myself, I can say I'm in the category, <coughs> but also understanding that you are stressed out or you have the trauma is also another angle because not everybody understand when he's traumatized or even to get help so but basically when it's a conflict setting we do understand that the pressure and the horror people sees subjects them automatically on that trauma but also for us in the host communities for instance in Medjugorje we also are traumatized because our streets we have bomb blast we feel gunshots and a lot of things and then we receive millions of people coming in, running away from terror. And then this also is another form of stress. I've worked directly with women who were under captivity of Boko Haram for years, and I've seen the change and the reactions and how they really act out of fear and even not willing to interact with ordinary people. Like myself, when I first went to meet with a couple of them, it was very difficult for them to open up and even start a conversation. It took a while to win back their trust and understand that the community feels exactly how they feel. And then this is a process. They need 
time to heal and get over their issues. So for example, a story I heard when I went to, uh, to one of the camps to interact with a young woman, she told me, I, love, I, I, I live with Boko Haram for three years before I escaped. And then the living condition was terrible for me. I had to marry one of them to make myself comfortable within the camp because if I refused to get married to them, then I would be turned into a slave. And those processes I did not because I wanted to stay with Boko Haram. I think, of course, about my family, but with time, I thought I should just be comfortable because there is no hope out there. And I feel people are not going to accept me back into the community, so I made peace and stayed with them. But now that I am out, I feel the world is not even a good place anymore because people wouldn't want us to stay back in our communities with them. Our children are being looked at like Boko Haram also. And this is a pain to me. So all these thoughts have continuously been coming out from different uh, women. And I met an 11-year-old girl who was also abducted and raped on several cases. And she said to me, I would want to go back to where I came from because I feel I'm restricted here in a camp or in a room where I don't have freedom. And there, I live like a queen because I have a husband, and then I have my own slaves who works with me. So such stories, and interestingly, I found out that most of these young girls do not know how the atrocities are being committed. They, do, they have no idea how bomb blast sins looks like. So they are automatically sympathetic to Boko Haram's activity because when we play a video of how people turn when there is a bomb blast, some of them actually cried because they were human. I mean, they felt, this is not what we were told. We were told when you press a button, you disappear. I mean, who thinks that? You understand they go through a process of a brainwashing. Violence means nothing to them because they kind of felt comfortable in that environment. And what they were told is Nigeria doesn't exist anymore because this is it. We're finished with everyone and you have to stay here. So trauma is real and there are people out there who need to understand they're even under trauma and needs healing. And this is internal healing they need. Jeremy, any observations? I mean, we've heard of rich. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, you know, um, in, in all of these cultures, and I know the answer in the United States, but I'm curious when we all know that trauma has these effects on our brains and it, and it can profoundly affect the way that we see and function in the world, what is the perception um, in your culture of, what it means to try to get help and how do they perceive like you know brain illness we call them mental illnesses how do they perceive this post-traumatic stress disorder etc so in in the refugee context like uh, for example in Lebanon uh, which I know uh, there's no uh, people they don't give uh, like that uh, interest in healing uh, trauma because they consider the situation as emergency. So they need to provide food, to provide other things. Even education, it's not a priority for them. So how about trauma and psychosocial support? So now we are trying to advocate more to provide psychosocial support, especially at the Syrian schools in all Lebanon. Like in Lebanon, there are more than 400,000 Syrian students. None of them is getting uh, uh, psychosocial support. So you can imagine here, the, the volume of this uh, problem. The problem down the road. Yeah. Consequent to that. You know, it, I really think like um, the trauma that really affected a lot of people from diaspora, you know, I, I, the thing is um, it kind of affected them because when you come to like developed countries, you know, and then your way of life is not longer the same, you know, because our way of life over there, you know, you share your life with a lot of siblings, auntie, uncles, you know, you do things together, you know, and the war kind of left the taste in everybody's mouth where everybody's always talking about war and, uh, and who we lost and sometimes we are laughing our way out of the trouble. And then over there, people were not really affected that much, you know, because they had, they still shared their lives. So, but when you are being reset to America, it kind of affected a lot, of, especially the laws of Sudan are being affected more, even the community too as well. And because everybody's isolated, you live by yourself. It's either you go to work nine to five, you come back, and there's no another connection. So I think that's, that's when uh, we need like a mechanism of how to really treat people who used to live by nature 
and now they live in a in a society where it's so gated it where you are alone. That's when I think that's when it really affected you. If I didn't really have interaction through sports, I, I would I would uh, I don't think I would be here sitting with you guys as well. So uh, I would be I would be sharing a different story. Yeah. That's exactly what happened with my relatives who uh, who took refuge in Germany or Sweden. They are living in first world uh, atmosphere, but again, I feel tra traumatized because there's no one to interact with. They are living in a new, a new uh, community. They don't speak their language. So how they can uh, cope with this new change in their life. So this also uh, affect a lot on them. There's, there's another example too I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, one of my friends, he lives in DC. We went to our village uh, a couple of years ago before before we raised the flags of our new nations. And then when we went to our village and then we took some of the guys that we knew and then to just take a long walk in a, in a forest so that the memory would start to come to them and then they start to tell you, you know, the things that they used to do. Even they are elder people now at this point. And then I kind of seen, you know, the way to treat these people, you know, to, to take them back to the nature, how they, they would show you the places that they used to be where they used to hunt, where they used to go and dance, and you know, they would share their life story. But to just sit around and ask a person like, hey, tell me about your life. No, it's not very easy for anyone to just like, hey, this is what happened, man. At night, I don't sleep. <laughs> yeah, to me, I think uh, on the local context, it's also, yes, a change in environment, still within the same locality, but just a different setting. For instance, we have people who left their communities. They're still within us, not international communities, but then they're settled within IDP camps. And some are settled within host communities, cotton, with their relatives and friends. And these are people who had millions of jobs and have been engaged in their own territory and homes, but then now wakes up that he has no money to feed his family, only rely on international support or support from family and friends. So this process is very difficult for people to adjust. And I think if I can say one thing that people would need, as Ke and uh, Mahmoud said, people need an environment that is, that is embraced in yes, but also their homes. People need homes. So emphasis on resettlement in the right way is also kind of one way to understand that people comes back to their home and this is their community and then start life over again. Of course, it's very difficult, you know, but you can see it vividly. A man with 12 children squatting in just a tent, which is not sufficient for even him and his wife, but with his 12 children and other people. So living condition is also something that actually subjects people to a lot of trauma. Well, I think it's common that we're here in, in all these cases you have to process uh, your trauma in a way with others that have the capacity to understand through either common experience or, uh, or common context. And, and, and I can imagine you know, leaving your, uh, your home, going to somewhere that's uh, completely foreign potentially, um, or be a, a, even if it's a refugee camp, um, at least you know you might have people with common experience there, but it still might be further traumatizing because it's it's not a home. And uh, the other concept of taking you know third world problems to a first world setting where there is no common experience that would also probably be quite difficult to find uh, resolution and and uh, and. Um, to be able to work through the problems. Yeah, because it, it, actually, you know, there's a lot of Sudanese who are South Sudanese who came to the States that got themselves in a lot of trouble and then they commit crimes and then they end up being in, spending years in prisons. Yeah. And then when our country become a new nation, they deported everybody, uh, everybody. They deported them back, even some of them, they died from current civil war because they didn't get really the help that they needed. It. And also, they didn't have any education opportunities. So you can imagine how many of us who came here, and then if I'm the only guy that is still talking about this story, <laughs> you know, something is not done right, you know, when it comes to like resettling someone from a new, from a refugee camp to, to a city, such as those cities in Midwest or wherever, you know. 
So this need to be looked into. I, th I personally, I think that we need to recognize, and you kind of touched on this a little bit, Mahmoud, is that the idea that you know if, if somebody had a bone sticking out and they're bleeding, they would get triaged right away. But we need to recognize that they that that somebody that's undergone these experiences has trauma. It, 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 identical trauma to physical trauma. It is physical trauma. It's just to a different organ that you can't see as readily and you need to fix it. Otherwise, it's going to lead to problems no matter where they are. So it seems to me two sort of fundamental conclusions from this. I mean, one is that you need to treat the head as much as you're treating any other part of the body. When of you're, course. When yeah. you're thinking about traumatic experiences. And then the other, that the nature of that treatment matters a lot, I mean, in terms of finding a path forward. Um, but I don't want to leave us just talking about the issues related to trauma and victimization because, of course, we're in a room with incredible leaders and leadership that has emerged from those situations. And I'd be remiss if we were just talking about the costs and not, um, and not the opportunities for leadership that have been taken advantage of. So um, let me start a little bit with you, Mahmoud, because, because you really moved from, from Syria, as you were saying, into Lebanon, and then have really tried to move forward um, as a leader within the refugee community. Can you talk a little bit about that and that experience and um, the lessons that you draw from that for others? Actually, when I moved from Syria, I was already admitted uh, to study in Aleppo University, but unfortunately, the, war, the Aleppo was burning at that time. So here I had to move to a new community, which is Lebanon, alone, without my family, without any resources to support myself, at least. In the first period, the first, let's say, six months to a year, uh, like I couldn't find any future. I went to a community that there's a, a huge tension between Syrians and Lebanese because, because Syrians can't work legally in Lebanon. So you can imagine that, like, I can't work legally. So I had to work illegally and many sit in labor work, so like I don't need a work permit. And that, uh, and that uh, this, uh, after the, these events, uh, I looked to myself like, I can't do this for my life. I was one of the best students in my class. So now I no longer have a future. When I talk with my friends back in Syria, or many of them, they took refuge uh, in Germany or uh, Sweden, many of them, are star uh, they start university. They are, do they are doing what, I, they, what they want to do and I'm still in the same place. Here I, I found by a pure chance an opportunity to volunteer to help the Syrian refugees in education in particular. I went there without any knowledge that here it might be my future. I went there and I got a job offer, uh, opportunity. I got a scholarship at one of the most like, pr uh, prominent universities in Lebanon. Here I like, I, I was thinking between myself, like, am I lucky to get this opportunity? No, I'm not lucky, because there are more than a million refugees in Lebanon looking for scholarships. So, because I wanted to continue, so this is what I want other people to think, to continue, to keep moving, uh, despite all the, uh, all the events that are happening with them. Like, I met hundreds of students. Like, now, I, I've, I've, uh, like did assessment for more than 3,000 scholarship, uh, scholarship application for people applying for our scholarships. I found that most of, uh, most of, most of the people, they are disparate. Like they, ju they are just applying because they saw an opportunity, not because they want to study, not because they want to apply. So here's the, you can see the, the, the essential thing. So people should think how to continue their life. Great, thank you. Kerry, you've traveled a long road from child soldier and lost boy to actor, uh, writer, professional in the fashion industry, and now spokesperson for refugees worldwide. How does that transformation take place? I don't even know how the hell did I collect all these titles. <laughs> <laughs> War is everything, you know. You change your way of life, and 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 of course, uh, if you have a huge part of me, you know. And then uh, it's about survival for me. So picking up from my own home and leaving my own family behind for over 18 years, I lost so much, you know. Uh, 
But because I know that I, I don't live for myself and it's not really about what I have done or where I have been and the places that I'm really going, you know, what really remains with me is the fact that, you know, um, you know, I'm sitting on top of other people's shoulders who are not alive today. So, like Fatima was saying earlier, you know, this is, this is my obligation, it's my responsibility to actually uh, educate myself enough and really remain close to the problems that is consuming my people on the ground. So, of course, I'm thankful that there's a lot of opportunity that came my way by living in America, and that made me appreciate America, where he become my home too. So he gave me a new way to have a different perspective about where I came from and also a good understanding about the people that really welcome me in a society of America. So I, I think I've been very lucky and, and I, I should do more. Fatima, observations from your experience? <coughs> yeah, I, I think I always uh, go with the fact that <clears throat> for every situation, it comes with a positive and negative opportunities and consequences. And uh, for young people, I think we should be ready to look at these opportunities and then grab them as fast as we can. Uh, I am saying this because I feel it was an opportunity I, I utilized to support other people and also become who I am today. Uh, as a young woman from my community where it's very competitive and very dominated by male, which I always face a threat of saying, oh, she travels a lot and she's not even married. And why is she even doing that? You know, it's very common in the Muslim world. And through this, I feel I have empowered many women and many children who I'm very proud of today. And I can stand up to say, even if I leave every service today, I have accomplished a mission, which I feel was an obligation on me and it still is. So for violence, which we usually say uh, at Search for Common Ground because I work with them at, as a youth coordinator working with uh, many young people on preventing and countering violent extremism and also peace building component in about uh, five African countries uh, across the Lake Chad region. Uh, I think young people have made a lot of contributions in their hard, hard situations, which we have to acknowledge the fact that violence was destructive, but also kind of uprooted a lot of great potentials from young people in those areas. Because I have seen a lot of community interventions that had touched many lives without even recognition. And many young people like myself are back there at home doing one thing or the other to support, transform their communities, which I usually appreciate and acknowledge the fact that USIP have seen the humanity in me, I can say, by inviting me to this great exchange to meet different world young leaders who have done amazing work in their community. And I feel through violence, this is an opportunity to learn and also go give back to the community. And this particular activity is actually given me a different sense of direction and dealing with more inner peace, as we've always discussed through this couple of days, inner peace. I mean, I feel I am more confident right now and I can work on me being peaceful with myself and transforming one person from my community to also be at peace with himself. And then this way, I think I've started a process where people would understand it's not all about <coughs> Uh, the, the violent condition, it's not all about the poor living condition or the poor medical condition, but also it matters when you're happy with yourself and when you can use the best of the little you have at the moment. So I think opportunity is out there and young people are doing amazing and we can do more. Go, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, observations from a personal or professional standpoint on this issue of leadership? <coughs> with, uh, with myself uh, <coughs> included in there, I mean, we just heard um, kind of what I was expressing, in, you, you need purpose. Uh, and purpose is probably the, one of the critical paths to healing. Um, and I think it's the secret to any fulfilling life. Uh, you need purpose um, and you need outlets um, to, uh, to express uh, to express yourself. 
So Fatima alluded to this glorious couple of days that we've had um, together uh, with a larger group of leaders and with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and I want to turn the conversation to that. And um, you gave your observations. I'll get quick observations from <coughs> the three of you, but want to then rapidly involve the rest of the group in the conversation because I want uh, folks who are watching to really have an opportunity to meet as many of the folks we've been with um, over the last few days because they are an incredible collection of leaders. Um, so just the top line quickly, um, first from you on our last few days and, his, and the experience with His Holiness. Honestly, the last few days for me were life-changing, not only meeting the Dalai Lama himself, but meeting these people. Here I can find uh, other people doing a great job. Like I can see that there's hope in this, in this world. Also meeting the Dalai Lama and the, the wisdom he, he gave to us, it really encouraged me to do more. Like now I, I watched mo uh, movies and videos for, for him, but like being with him in the same room, it gives like totally another experience. Like you can feel it. Like, his, uh, his sense of humor, his wisdom is amazing. So, thank you, you SIP, for giving us this opportunity. And I wish and I hope that more, more young leaders can join this program to learn uh, about this work. I promise this was not an attempt at an infomercial. No. <laughs> Gary, thoughts? Oh, yes. It's, In uh, brief. it's actually, you know, a meeting of uh, the holiness. Uh, it's a lifetime opportunity for me because it confirmed a lot of things, you know, the guidance. And also, I felt like it had like an evolution in the journey that I've been having. And to be around him for three days straight, of course, I'm really willing to really make him a proud uncle or auntie <coughs> to carry the message that he's been carrying along to change the humanity. There's no better human being than that. And I appreciate the opportunity. Jeremy, thoughts before we go to the rest of the... Um, I was just uh, so profoundly uh, thankful for the opportunity and so Im impressed with um, the, the idea that you can really eliminate human suffering through compassion. And his conviction, which really bolstered mine, is... Uh, our future really rests in the hands of these brilliant young leaders because they're going to carry the torch and they're uh, going to think outside of the contrived boxes that we sit in. And so uh, I loved that he has a profound optimism that our futures are in good hands. 